Um, a few things in preparation for section. Um, first of all, be sure you know where your section is meeting. Uh, that may sound trivial, it's not. Uh, no, because uh, they're, uh, you know, meeting in one group meets here, but one's over at, what is it, 124 Mount Auburn. And just be sure you know where you have to get to so we can start on time in sections on Thursday. Um, uh, there's a first writing assignment is a public narrative worksheet that we're asking you to work on and complete, well, do, do your initial work on it by Wednesday midnight. Uh, send it in. Uh, I don't know if we're going to be receiving on Wednesday midnight, but we'll, we'll receive them early Thursday morning. Um, the, the, the worksheet is a guide to developing your public narrative. It's not like to be answered question. It's not like a questionnaire. Uh, it's, it's a way to provoke your thinking. And at the end of class today, I think it'll be a little clearer about what that actually means. But it's intended to provoke your thinking so you can write a couple of pages uh, of thinking about uh, how to put your public narrative together, which you will then share uh, a, a two-minute version of it uh, in section on Thursday. And so that's uh, find out where the section, where you're meeting, do the prep work, and then we'll, and come with a two-minute public narrative uh, prepared. Um, for Saturday, Marsha, still section. Right here. Um, so, uh, Professor Gans just mentioned it, but this Saturday, uh, and as you probably, if you've been looking ahead to the syllabus, you'll notice there will be um, a number of uh, activities that will take place outside of class to really kind of enhance the experience. Uh, they are mandatory. So the first one is this Saturday uh, at 8.30 on the fifth floor of Tubman. Uh, it's from 8.30 to 3. Breakfast begins for that, in that first half hour and sort of uh, to experience uh, taking responsibility uh, and um, supporting a shared purpose. We are asking folks to uh, bring something to the potluck breakfast in the morning. So if there is a type of food that you're interested in bringing, just sign up uh, right next to it and we'll look forward to seeing you on Saturday morning. And so. Um be prepared. No, it'll be fun. Uh, the main thing is to pray for non-blizzard. Uh, that's kind of the main thing to, to, to hope for. Uh, but yeah, we'll be there from 9 to 3 and um, well, all, all shall be revealed. Uh, we're also going to be joined by students from um, where? Stonehill College, Syracuse University, and UMass Amherst, yeah, who also are teaching versions of this curriculum there. Uh, and so they come come over to join us for skill sessions. <coughs> so we'll outnumber whoever's in Harvard Square, and um, no, it'll be it'll be fun. Uh, and then um, I, I want to emphasize on auditors and fellows just to be clear that that um, the expectation is that you do all the work, no exceptions. I mean papers, the the sessions, the whole thing. We found in the past when we make exceptions, they usually come back to haunt us. Uh, in multiple ways. And so it's the same deal for everybody. And that's what Inbal is uh, talking about, about the learning agreement. So we're really, really clear on what our mutual expectations are. Um, also, uh, we sent out a link for that leadership survey that we're doing. And we had 43 responses as of a couple of days ago. Uh, if, you, if you didn't respond, you should be getting or did get or will get an email from UTF. Please respond. We want to get as complete a response to that uh, as we can. And I think that's all the logistics we've got. OK, so then um, what we need to do is pick up where we left off on Thursday. Uh, it's going to be a little hard. Uh, it was, um, was it 10 seconds hard or 12 seconds or 15 seconds? 10, yeah, OK. Uh, now, oh, we, we didn't write up what the, what the things were. Maybe we can uh, write up, yeah. It was your name, uh, where you're from, what your parents do, um, what your work has been, school, program, and I'm organizing somebody to do something. In other words, what you're thinking about in terms of, a, in terms of who you want to organize to do what. While she's writing, you can think, reflect. And, then, and this is sort of, we, we won't know, you know, because we, we you know, so it, it'll be up to you to, to share. Yeah. Yeah, that's like you know, work, school program, 
and organizing idea of, of what your organizing project will be. And you know, we went, we started out there, and but there's no guarantee people sat in the same place. So uh, we're just going to have to start arbitrarily. So who would like to start? Okay. Go. Okay, my, name, my name is Julian. I'm from uh, Hank, Illinois, South Chicago. My mother works as a customer service agent, and my father works in a factory. I used to be a science teacher. Um, I am a third year in the law school. I'm hoping to uh, organize um, students at law school around the world. Great. And we'll just keep going. <laughs> Against. Yeah, it was a successful project in East Boston last year that stopped the casino development there. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sun Hawk Kim. Uh, I'm a second or first year MTS student at Harvard Divinity School. I'm from Los Angeles, California. Uh, my parents are in retail and I've been working with uh, anti casino groups in East Boston and Revere, and that's what I plan to focus my uh, project on. Okay, well, let's go to the next row, who, whoever didn't go. Okay. I'm Raquel Rodriguez. I'm also at the Education School and the Special Studies Program. 
Um, I'm from Frederick, Maryland, but uh, most recently I was working in Baltimore with high school students um, in a mentoring program. And uh, I'm looking to uh, organize people around holistic spiritual development as well as professional. My name is Allegra Stowe. I'm a community fellow. I'm from New Jersey. My dad is a computer programmer. My mom works as a therapist and now a full-time homemaker. Um, I said I'm a community fellow. I work as a disability rights organizer at the Boston Center for Independent Living and I'm organizing people with disabilities for more affordable housing in Massachusetts. Hi, my name is Jennifer Lee. I'm from Alamance, California. My mom works the overnight shift at the post office and my dad's a uh, Prior to school, I was working in city government and at NRC Department of Business and Research Planning and I'm organizing around immigrant and LGBT rights. Hi, I'm I'm Cameron Allen from Austin, Texas. My mom's a librarian. My dad's a long story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a teacher of adult ESL literacy. Um, I'm in the Ed School of the Learning and Teaching Program. And I hope to organize Ed School students to have a conference about adult literacy. <laughs> Hi, my name is Talia Porteni. I'm a student at the School of Public Health. Um, I work at the Ministry of Health of Mexico. Before I came here, I'm Mexican. My mom's, a, uh, my dad's a businessman. My mom's uh, an economist and works in an NGO. And I hope to help organize the Mexican student diaspora to be better connected and <coughs> like to prevent brain pain. Who did you go? Yeah. Okay, my name is Dimitri Bancoli. I'm from Nigeria. Um, my mother is a, a chairman of the family business. My father used to be a leader of the opposition. I was Speaker of Parliament before coming here, and I haven't decided on my program yet. I'm a Mason fellow as well. Okay, welcome. My name's Bill Finney. I'm from the Philadelphia area. My mom is a teacher, my dad's a graphic designer. Uh, before this, I was briefly in the oil industry, and now I'm switching gears and getting my master's in environmental and water quality engineering <laughs> at MIT, not Harvard. Okay. Who's next? I'm Mary. Uh, I'm from Virginia. My parents are um, before this, I worked in consulting and then in local government, and now I'm at Harvard Divinity School doing an MPS. Um, not quite sure what I'm organizing yet, still talking to possible constituents. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Sam Friedman, originally from Philadelphia. My mom is a career counselor. I don't know my father. Um, before school, I was teaching ESL. I'm in the International Ed Policy Program at Pugsy, and I want to organize a professional organization for ESL. Uh, hi, my name is Michaela. I'm from Slovakia. My dad is a teacher, and I'm I'm a career at the Kelly School. Uh, my mother is a housewife, my father is a retired ambassador. And what I would like to do is to develop a digital platform that organizes the organizers. Okay. That's a tough that's a tough thing. <laughs> yep.
trying to organize another revolution in Egypt? <laughs> Back over there. Uh, Camilo from Bogota, Colombia. Uh, my father is a lawyer working with human rights in Colombia, and my mother is a consultant. Prior to coming to Brandeis, I was working with an NGO from the Mennonite Church doing uh, protection for civil society, yeah. shooting former child soldiers. And I'm in a uh, development coexistence program at Brandeis, and I'm trying to organize students to do an emergency fund for grad students. Hi, I'm Tulsi Mehta. I'm at the Ed School in the Arts and Education Program. My mother designs, my father invests. Um, I am a movement artist and a yoga instructor and have uh, worked with training teachers in somatics, and which is mind-body awareness. And I want to organize students around any of the ideas. Hi, I'm Alison Gandrinok, a mid-career here from South Wales and recently Cambridge. My parents are retired. I've managed volunteers to raise money. I'm an entrepreneur and problem solver and a recovering strategy consultant for Mom of Three. I'd like to solve gender inequality. I'd like to advocate high value flexible work and I'm going to start by bringing local moms to the iLab. Hi, I'm Arjun. Um, I'm from originally from India, now in Silicon Valley. And my project, my, my, uh, my mother's English teacher, my father's passed away. And my project is around trying to find the right balance between uh, it's an H1 alumni society. So there's this big debate about uh, uh, skilled professionals and unskilled professionals and what the right mix is uh, in terms of immigration. <coughs> My name is Maggie. I'm from the MIT Department of Urban Studies in Florida. I'm originally from New Jersey, but I moved here from New Orleans where I was working in affordable housing. Uh, my dad is a financial advisor, my mom is a realtor and homemaker, and I have some issues in mind, but not an organization or organizing project specifically. Okay. Who's left over here? Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Rohan. Uh, I'm originally from India, but I've been based in New Jersey. Uh, my parents are uh, bank in banking and accounting. Um, prior to school, I was a medical student. Uh, where I also help run a free clinic. I'm an MPP at the Kennedy School, and I hope to organize to help provide services for the homeless. Hi, I'm uh, Alona from Israel. Uh, my dad um, is a computer programmer, and my mom is a legal advisor. Um, prior to uh, school, I was working for the Israeli Prime Minister's office. Um, I'm a mid-career at the Kennedy School, and I'm also a Wexner Fellow, and I'm hoping um, to gather my Wexner f um, fellows and organize a project around social change in Israel. Who's next? My name is Daniel Koff. I'm from Brookline, Mass. My parents are, my mom's a biochemist. My dad's an urban planner. Before this, I was a freelance designer and filmmaker. I'm now in my first year at GSD, and I'm doing a project to eliminate student debt. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Who's left? You got everybody? Is that everybody? All right, how about a round of applause for everybody? <laughs> yeah. Should be kind of an interesting class, uh, I think. Uh, so uh, thanks for uh, contributing all that. So, um, and, and uh, that's just sort of the ground from which we're going to start. So to, to frame what we're going to do today, uh, just to remind everyone, uh, this is a class in leadership. Um, it, uh, it's rooted in those three questions that I posed at the beginning, Rabbi Hillel's questions about the relationship of self to other to action as a, as a ground for understanding leadership as accepting responsibility for enabling others to achieve purpose under conditions of uncertainty. And organizing we introduced as uh, developing leadership, not just one's own leadership, but developing the leadership to build community and out of the resources of community to build the power to act, asking who are my people, what problems do they face, and how can they use their resources to develop the power to deal with those problems. And we also explain that we're entering this uh, around uh, based on five core practices, uh, building relationships as foundational, uh, narrative as motivational, uh, strategy as directional, uh, action as what hopefully comes out of it, and structure as hanging it all together, keeping it all together, which is sort of what that bike there illustrates, which is also an illustration of our
pedagogy. Um, and we also emphasize two uh, dimensions to this framework. One is uh, the temporal aspect over here, uh, foundations, kickoffs, peaks, and then a major peak. So it's, a, it's, a, it's time as an arrow kind of sequence to it. And then the second one is about uh, leadership, um, where is it? Oh, yeah, there. Uh, is about uh, understanding leadership as interdependent, as cascaded, not as, about, not as being like about that dot in the middle, which we're going to come back to again and again. And so this week, next week, you know, think of as sort of part of that foundation period there for the class or for your projects or whatever. Uh, and this week with the focus on more on yourself and those in relationship to whom you want to do this project, this organizing, and next week focusing more on the actual shape of a project and what it might actually look like. And so to get into this first question is what we're going to use public narrative as a way of doing. Uh, understanding narrative, uh, the practice there, the motivational practice, um, the one that's actually driving the back of the bike. Notice this is a very cleverly designed little image here. Uh, narrative is driving the bike strategy is directioning or, or focusing the direction of the bike. Uh, as the source is as, as understanding values as source of motivation um, for oneself, for others, uh, for the whole project, for what the thing is all about. And as a way of, of, uh, of looking at this, when I was doing my organizing um, in, in civil rights and farm workers and all the rest of it, I was always interested in strategy because um, we were always in a David and Goliath situation. We were always David and the opposition was always Goliath. We were always the insurgents. And so it meant strategy really mattered. It meant that you had to figure out how to compensate for resources you did not have with greater resourcefulness. It meant being more creative. It meant being smarter. And, and so that was always a, a key issue. But it was also clear you could have a wonderful strategy, and if nobody showed up, it wasn't going to be much good. Uh, and in those movements in particular, the issue of showing up was huge. Uh, motivation, courage, um, you know, having the courage to actually take the risks involved in changing one's circumstances. Um, enough um, uh, trust in one another uh, to, to uh, be able to act thinking that others would have your back to, to act together. Enough hopefulness to, to aspire to possibility out there even when it was uh, not a, a logical proposition, but enough of a possibility that you might try it. So this question of motivation was really core to the organizing work. And when I came back to school, discovered that, in fact, psychologists, guess what, had studied this. Uh, in particular, Jerome Bruner, who taught for many years at the Ed School here, a cultural psychologist, uh, described it as, as understanding the two different ways of knowing. And we have readings about this this week, and that's what this chart represents over here is an understanding that to engage the hands down here, is the action piece, um, it's important. The, the, the cognitive side is important. I mean, we do, we map the world cognitively. Uh, we understand where things are in the world in relationship to each other. That's really important to figure out pathways, ways to do things, means, efficiency, strategy, all the rest of it. But that only tells part of the story. Uh, because we also map the world another way. We map the world uh, affectively, or we map the world in emotion. Uh, we map the world, we learn to map the world in that this inspires me, this frightens me, this uh, disgusts me, this lifts me up, uh, this gives me hope. This, and that second mapping of the world, attaching the emotional meaning, is what in fact gives meaning to the objects and people and experiences of the world. Another way to describe it is that what we're doing is valuing the world through the emotional mapping that we do upon it. And so, you know, you can, and, and that it turns out is where the domain of motivation uh, and the domain of narrative is. It's over on this side. You know, and, and because you can't really get here from here. Um, you can reason about how to do things it's not going to get you to, why does it really matter? Why does it matter more than this other thing? Why do we really care? Now, that second chart is intended to represent, to, to, to communicate that. And Martha Nussbaum, one of the readings, uh, writes about uh, uh, 
the research on people with damaged amygdalas where they are limited in the emotion they can experience, very limited. They're capable of reasoning options to how to solve a problem, on and on. But you know what they can't do? Uh, yeah, they can't decide. They can't make choice, they can't make decisions because decisions rest on value judgments, and value judgments, it turns out, require emotional <coughs> information. In other words, emotion communicates vital information about what's important, about what's of value, about what's cooking with ourselves and others, and when we cut ourselves off from emotional information, we're left without a compass. And so that's sort of, that, that's a key piece to understand because if we are going to talk about values, we have to then speak the language of emotion. We have to understand the language of emotion, be able to communicate in the language of emotion. Now, we also know that there are some emotions that facilitate mindful action, purposeful action, and other emotions inhibit mindful or purposeful action. And, and I'm going to use that word mindful, purposeful action, because we're talking about here action with intentionality. Now, most of the time we're operating on autopilot. Most of the time we operate on habit. Most of the time. You know, going along and, you know, you're driving along and you're not thinking about it. You listen to the radio or whatever and you drive along. Uh, you're on autopilot. It's very efficient. You don't have to rethink how to drive the car every time you get in the car. You don't, you don't, you don't have to, oh, now I push the clutch pedal if you still have a clutch pedal or whatever. You know? Very efficient. But then a truck pulls out. Um, you stay on autopilot. What happens? You die. Yeah, no, yeah, you go in. yeah, you're in the truck. So our brains have evolved what's called the surveillance system, and the surveillance system detects anomaly. It, de it detects the unexpected, and so that truck that you weren't planning on that that truck comes, and and your surveillance system goes truck, 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 and you sort of experience that as, oh, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, and you experience it as anxiety. Now, that anxiety is very beneficial because what it's communicating is the fact that you better pay attention. Things have changed. They're not what you expected. And, and the first challenge that we often face in, in, in organizing and often in leadership is how to get people to pay attention. Because <laughs> uh, everybody's, we're all operating within these domains of habit. We're used to perceiving problems in certain ways. We describe them in certain ways. We numb ourselves. We rationalize. And there we are. Now, you're not going to get very far as long as people are still in that mode. Uh, you know, I mean, I was, I was organizing farmworkers, and we could have a wonderful leaflet about all the great benefits. That you, nobody's going to even read that if, if they were so fearful that something was going to happen if they did. It's just not. So the first issue, then, is how to get attention, how to break through habit. And that's what this is intended to represent inertia and apathy. These are the things that sort of keep us in, in, in the domain of, of, uh, of it's always been this way. Urgency. How do we create urgency? How do you create urgency? How do you make something urgent? How do you? How do you make something urgent? Huh? Explain why now is the time. Explain why well, now is the time. How else do you make it urgent? I mean, um, what? What? Yeah, how about, I mean, let's say you got a problem set due tomorrow, and you also got to decide what you're going to do after graduation. What are you going to do tonight? Yeah. I mean, I mean that's how we, we use deadlines. We use deadlines. We use drop-dead dates. We use all that stuff to create urgency. Now, the challenge is to make the important <coughs> urgent, because sometimes they get diverged, like, like in that deal. But that's why we do campaigns with deadlines, with, with there's just enough time. There's urgency of need. How can we tolerate another day with this circumstance? And there's urgency of opportunity. We just have three more days, and then the offer will close. You know, you see it on television all the time. 24 hours left, six hours left, you know, until, you know what I'm talking about. This is sort of basic stuff. So urgency, and another is anger. And by anger, I don't mean rage, but I do mean outrage. I mean the dissonance that we experience when the world as it is, we find in sharp contrast with the world as we believe it ought to be. It's that, that tension. Uh, the, the, ICE, uh, the INS did these raids in New Bedford a couple, three years ago. 
picked up people off workplaces, um, shipped them off, uh, left kids abandoned all over town. It's just the parents disappeared. Um, and now, you know, you could hear about that and say, oh, no problem. Uh, really? No problem? Something wrong with that. That dissonance, that sense of injustice is really what we're talking about, is a very powerful motivator. And, and organizers are often called uh, agitators because what they do is heighten the contradiction between what we believe ought to be and what is. And that tension then can be resolved often only through action. So these are a couple of ways of creating anxiety. You never thought you'd be taking a class on how to create anxiety. So let's see that you do a great job. You create a lot of anxiety. Terrific. What's our default response to anxiety? Huh? What's our default response? We love it. We embrace it. Huh? Yeah. Like, oh, excuse me, I'm going to run the other way. Or, oh, kill, kill. Or maybe I'll freeze and it'll pass me by, right? Fight, flight, freeze, fear. So that's the default response. Constructive, creative, purposeful, useful, not especially reactive, fundamentally reactive. So culturally, we've evolved ways to deal with this, or try to deal with it. And culturally, we've evolved ways to learn to manage the anxiety so that it doesn't turn into fear, or that at least we can counter the fear. And that's with a different set of emotions. It's not like saying, oh, don't be afraid. Oh, OK, right, I'm not afraid. It's understanding that we are in an emotional domain, and so if we're going to counter fear, often what we need to do is find ways to create some hope, some sense of possibility. Now, by hope, I don't mean um, flowers in May and, and, oh, everything's going to turn out all right. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, the definition of hope that I like is um, my modern 12th century scholar um, defined hope as belief in the plausibility of the possible, as opposed to the necessity of the probable. I'll say that again. That to be, he was arguing, to be a realist is to recognize that we live in a world in which the probable is not always what happens. Sometimes the possible does. It's always probable Goliath will win. That's probable, always. Sometimes David does. It's that sense of possibility that he suggests is where hope lies. And we experience that in our own lives, in lives of the communities, lives of others, that sense of possibility, that precious sense that it could be other than what we expect it to be. And that's also a part of being realistic and cultivating that sense of hopefulness. Isolation is another killer diller, right? Um, it's all alone. That's where solidarity, community, love, empathy comes in. Self-doubt. I can't do it. People like me can't do it. I don't have enough of whatever it is. People like me aren't qualified to. You know all the voices, all those voices. They just stop us from acting, keep us from acting. We have to create a sense of Ickman. What's Ickman? Oh, smart class. Yeah, you can make a difference. I mean, we can call it self-efficacy. Uh, but it, it's, it's, yes, yes, I do have consequence. Yes, I have some possibility of making a difference. I can make a difference in the world. You, you know. So then the question becomes how to create, cultivate this over this. Because by getting this, we get into a place where then we can respond as opposed to react. Then we can, confronted by that source of anxiety, we can say, why? Where did this come from? How do I deal with this? What's a, what, how could, I can ask for more information. Then I'm in a position to exercise agency and not simply be reactive. And that's a lot of what this deal is all about. Hang on just a sec. Now, where does story come in? Well, this is the stories over here. All stories have really three, three elements. Uh, stories have a plot. They have a character. They're immoral, immoral. And I've yet to find a place where this is not so. So a plot, what does it take to make a plot a plot? Uh, I got up this morning, got in my car, and came to Kennedy School and came to class. Is that a plot? I mean, you ready to pay money to find out what happened next? <laughs> Very exciting. So make it a plot. Turn it 
journey so far? Oh, it's beginning, okay, and what was the source of the flat tire? Or what happened? Or, let's go. Let's make it a little more interesting. Yeah? A porcupine. Okay. So this is a sign of the new of the new porcupine invasion of Cambridge. This is the first, the first, the early warning sign. Wow, it's the first one. You know, they're fabled every year that they come, the porcupines. And and so how did I escape? What happened? There was the porcupine under my car, and there were others on the horizon. <laughs> what happened then? What happened then? Come on. Use the emergency eject button in your car to <laughs> Oh, I parachuted out, but then where did I, there were all those porcupines down there. I just want to land on those porcupines. Fun. And that was when the great golden eagle swept down and brought me to class. No. So, all right, what's, what's the point I'm making here? When does it get interesting? Yeah, the unexpected. It gets interesting when something crazy happens, something weird, something not expected. Look, up to that point, it's just boring. And at that point, oh, start with, oh, oh, what's, so now the question I have for you is why? Why do you care? Why did it get interesting when it, it was sort of it was vaguely interesting with the flat tire, but it got really interesting with the porcupine assault on Cambridge? <laughs> why? Come on, people spend billions of dollars a year on, yeah. on movies, on novels, on plays, on all this stuff, and it's all basically the same thing. Why? Yeah, but so what? So what? Why do you care? You want to see people overcome challenge. Why? What if it's not even a people? What if it's like, you know, a green dragon? Or what if it's, uh, you know, the Khaleesi, the mother of dragons? Or that's, a, that's an obscure scholarly reference to those who know the reference it refers to. No. No, I mean, it can be, doesn't even have to be a, a person, but, but you're on the right track, I think. What, what's its thing? What's its thing? What's its thing? Huh? Resistance, knowing how to be resilient, being reminded yeah. how, how to face adversity. Yeah, I think, I think you're very, very close to it there, yeah. So we're surfacing the moral. About well, and the moral comes, see, what, what's... Think about this. How many times a day does the unexpected happen to you in little ways? You know, the tickets are sold out for the thing, or you got a ticket, you didn't want one, or whatever. Or, or then there's the big things. Marriages break up, you know, people lose jobs, uh, we lose loved ones. I mean, when you think about it, the character of our existence as human beings, conscious human beings, is actually to have to deal with the, inspect the unexpected a whole lot. In fact, you could argue that's when we're at our most human. Because that's when choice is real. Because there isn't rules, there isn't a plan. Something comes our way, we've got to respond, we got to, what are we going to do? And, and, and we know that those moments really matter and we're the least prepared for them. And we seem to be infinitely curious to learn how to deal with them. And because in, in stories what happens is because we can identify with the protagonist of the story empathetically, we're able to experience what's happening in the story, not just, not just learn about it as sort of a cognitive plus as a principle. We're actually there, and we understand now from the brain research how mirror neurons work, how actually a person hearing a powerful story told actually experiences it. You know, because we're there with them, and so we feel the courage, we feel the pain, we feel the challenge, and we feel the source of overcoming it. And so because we can identify with it, we experience the content of the story, the moral that it teaches is not simply haste makes waste. We actually experience haste making waste. <laughs> Does this make sense? So, you know, this, this is why, where'd you hear the first stories? Where'd you hear your first stories? Yeah. yeah. See, Jerome Brunner, uh, also, you know, from the ed school, he's sort of saying that 85% of the time that, that parents spend with young children is in storytelling. What's that about? Well, he says, you know, it's, it's coaching them in how to become choiceful human beings, in how to cope with uncertainty, in how to learn to become agents, how to, how to begin to act with agency. 
And you know, it's like, you know, let me tell you about Uncle Charlie. He went wrong, but let me tell you about Aunt Harriet. She went the right way. You know, all families have that. Faith traditions, cultural traditions, all teach through stories, and this is what they're teaching. They're teaching how to find the emotional resources for agency. How to find the emotional resources, and those resources turn out to be the values that are central to our lives. And that's, why, that's the connection then between stories and values and courage and motivation. And so the what public narrative is about and, and why we're working on it this week, it's a way to harness the power of story to the work of leadership. By le learning to use story to, first of all, communicate to others what's called you to do what you're doing. Make yourself understood by <laughs> others. Now, you know, there used to be this view that leadership was all about being impervious, you know? That, that, you know, leadership is like, you know, perfect, impervious. I don't, I mean, I don't know where that, it's a myth, anyway. You can't learn anything from perfect people, anyway. One of the best exemplars of leadership, or one of the most powerful teachers of leadership, is uh, Moses, or Nebi Musa, as, as he's described, who's probably one of the examples of the most flawed leadership around, because there's so much to learn from his struggles. And so, so it's accepting enough vulnerability to allow other people to see something of you, to get you, to get what you're about. Because if you're going to call on other people to join you, then where does your moral authority come from? What, who, you know, who are you? We had a guy that ran for president in this country a while back who could never tell his story. Remember John Kerry? He couldn't tell it. He had a great story. Couldn't tell it. So you know who told it? His story got told. The opposition. Swift boat. His opposition told his story. See, your story will be told if you're in public life. You choose. You author it, somebody else authors it. That's your choice. So that's what story of self. But story of self then isn't just by yourself. This is about leadership. So how does it connect to the people whom you're trying to motivate to act? That's the story of us. What values are shared by this community that you're trying to engage in a source of action, and what's the challenge to those values that requires action, and that's what a story of now is. What is the urgent challenge and source of hope that requires action? And so this is not a script, but it's a way of communicating an urgent challenge felt by you and by your community, the source of values in that community, and your connection to both. Okay? So, this, this is what we're focusing on this week. And now we're going to look at an example right now. And this, this first example was from uh, uh, 19, or sorry, 2004, uh, when a young guy who was running for the Senate in Illinois uh, was given a chance to give a keynote speech at the Democratic Convention. Uh, and uh, he made an impression. Uh, and uh, uh, this was uh, how uh, Barack Obama introduced himself to the country. Uh, and what we're going to look at is the first seven minutes, just the first seven minutes. Now, in these seven minutes, here's what to look for. First, is he telling a story of self? When does he shift to a story of us? There's a shift. Then, when does he shift to a story of now? There's a second shift. You'll, you'll hear all three. Second, stories are all constructed around choice, moments of choice. Choice points. What are the choices? Because a story is a challenge, a choice, and an outcome. This is what happens in a story. And so what are the choices that are the backbone of this narrative of his? Third, what are the values communicated through those choices? The choices are evidence of values. And finally, what, are the, what about the details? What about the details? Why do the details matter? So let's take a look and then we'll be briefed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dick Durbin.
you make us all proud. On behalf of the great state of Illinois, crossroads of the nation, land of Lincoln, let me express my deepest gratitude for the privilege of addressing this convention. Tonight is a particular honor for me because, let's face it, my presence on this stage is pretty unlikely. My father was a foreign student, born and raised in a small village in Kenya. He grew up herding goats, went to school in a tin roof shack. His father, my grandfather, was a cook, a domestic servant to the British. But my grandfather had larger dreams for his son. Through hard work and perseverance, my father got a scholarship to study in a magical place, America, that shone as a beacon of freedom and opportunity to so many who had come before. While studying here, my father met my mother. She was born in a town on the other side of the world, in Kansas. Her father worked on oil rigs and farms through most of the Depression. The day after Pearl Harbor, my grandfather signed up for duty, joined Patton's army, marched across Europe. Back home, my grandmother raised a baby and went to work on a bomber assembly line. After the war, they studied on the GI Bill, bought a house through FHA, and later moved west, all the way to Hawaii, in search of opportunity. And they too had big dreams for their daughter. A common dream born of two continents. My parents shared not only an improbable love, they shared an abiding faith in the possibilities of this nation. They would give me an African name, Barack, or Blessed, believing that in a tolerant America, your name is no barrier to success. They imagined, they imagined me going to the best schools in the land, even though they weren't rich, because in a generous America, you don't have to be rich to achieve your potential. They're both passed away now. And yet I know that on this night, they do look down on me with great pride. They stand here, and I stand here today, grateful for the diversity of my heritage, aware that my parents' dreams live on in my two precious daughters. I stand here knowing that my story is part of the larger American story, that I owe a debt to all of those who came before me, and that in no other country on earth is my story even possible. Tonight, we gather to affirm the greatness of our nation. Not because of the height of our skyscrapers, or the power of our military, or the size of our economy. Our pride is based on a very simple premise, summed up in a declaration made over 200 years ago. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is the true genius of America. A faith, a faith in simple dreams, an insistence on small miracles, that we can tuck in our children at night and know that they are fed and clothed and safe from harm. That we can say what we think, write what we think without hearing a sudden knock on the door. That we can have an idea and start our own business without paying a bribe that we can participate in the political process without fear of retribution, and that our votes will be counted, at least most of the time. <laughs> this year, in this election, we are called to reaffirm our values and our commitments, to hold them against a hard reality, and see how we're measuring up to the legacy of our forebears and the promise of future generations. And fellow Americans, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, I say to you tonight, we have more work to do. More work to do 
for the workers I met in Galesburg, Illinois, who are losing their union jobs at the Maytag plant that's moving to Mexico, and now are having to compete with their own children for jobs that pay seven bucks an hour. More to do for the father that I met who was losing his job and choking back the tears wondering how he would pay $4,500 a month for the drugs his son needs without the health benefits that he counted on. More to do for the young woman in East St. Louis and thousands more like her who has the grades, has the drive, has the will, but doesn't have the money to go to college. Now, don't get me wrong, the people I meet in small towns and big cities and diners and office parks, they don't expect government to solve all their problems. They know they have to work hard to get ahead, and they want to. Go into the collar counties around Chicago, and people will tell you they don't want their tax money wasted by a welfare agency or by the Pentagon. Go, in, go into any inner city neighborhood, and folks will tell you that government alone can't teach our kids to learn. They know that parents have to teach that children can't achieve unless we raise their expectations and turn off the television sets and eradicate the slander that says a black youth with a book is acting white. They know those things. People don't expect, people don't expect government to solve all their problems but they sense deep in their bones that with just a slight change in priorities, we can make sure that every child in America has a decent shot at life and that the doors of opportunity remain open to all. They know we can do better and they want that choice. In this election, we offer that choice. Our party has chosen a man to lead us who embodies the best this country has to offer and that man is John Kerry. And that's the end of that story. Uh, okay, now we're going to look at another example in just a few moments. So I want to, I want to make, uh, we're going to briefly, uh, lights, 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 we got lights somewhere? Uh, good. Uh, did you hear a story of self? All right, when did he switch to the us? When was the switch? Yeah, it's a, it's a very explicit, it's foreshadowed and referenced back, but it's a very explicit, my story is part of the greater American story. When does he shift to the story of now? Yeah. Okay, and just before the Maytag workers, what is, what is the phrase? We have, more work to do. we have more work left to do. So here's why I'm here, here's what we share, here's a threat to what we share. Okay, that's the basic structure in three parts there. Now in that first part, what are some of the choices that he references? What are some choices he refers to? Choices by whom? What kinds of choices? Yeah. Um, his parents' decisions and anything wrong. Okay, so what uh, values are embedded in that choice? Values, like what? Um, that you will specifically say that you can name your child whatever, and that will make a difference um, of their position of power. So what, how would you describe the feelings associated with that choice? Huh? Okay. You know, a sense of worth, a sense, yeah, and what else? Yeah, maybe a little courage? Maybe a little hopeful? I mean, was it a tolerant, generous America? Is that, have we, are we, are we there now, let, 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 let alone then? I mean, so there, there's, a, there's a lot of aspiration and courage in that. What, what are some of the others? Some other choices referenced, just in that first part. Uh, yeah. The choice of his father to come to the U.S. Okay. And what did his father do before? <coughs> Goats. And what about his grandfather? Okay. Why do those details matter? Huh? Why? All right. Now, suppose he says, um, instead of those little choices that I just described, uh, he says, uh, I come from a background of... Uh, Courage, hope, and um, hard work. Let's move on. See, see, that's the difference. See, it's empty words. But by referencing real choices made by real people, we are able to then begin to get a sense of it. Now, here he chooses choices of, about people who influenced him. He doesn't talk about his own choices, which is itself an interesting choice for a politician to make, to sort of say, wait a second, I'm not going to do my resume 
I'm going to give these people a sense of where I came from. Maybe that way there's a sense of where I'm going. Maybe there's a basis of a relationship, then I'm not just trying to sell something. So it was an interesting choice. Now when he goes to, and there's more we could unpack about this, but he goes to the story of us, and in the story of us he also makes a very explicit choice about where to go in American <laughs> history. Where does he go? And why the Declaration of Independence and not the Constitution, do you think? Why would he go there and not the other one? American history folks. What's the difference between these two documents? The Constitution has a three-fifths clause that yeah. contradicts what The Constitution legitimates inequality. Blacks count three-fifths of a white. Uh, Declaration of Independence is aspirational. It claims equality. <coughs> so he's choosing where he's going related to the values that he is trying to make central to what he's doing. So there's choice there. And when he gets to the story of now, how does he begin to make that real? How does he begin to make real the challenge the country faces? That's when he trots out his statistical analysis, right? No. <laughs> what does he do? Stories of real people. And what's a common thread that runs through those people? What, what's common to all three of those stories? Huh? They're struggling. See, he's not saying we have poor people and people that can't uh, go to college. He's saying, this guy had a job, he just lost it. How's he going to pay for his kid's medicine? She got into college, she didn't have the money, how's she going to go? Each one is a little plot moment. Each one is a person facing a moment of the unexpected that they have to respond to, and that's why we begin to get the emotional content. Now, there's a lot more we could unpack here, because he also then goes on to offer a pathway to action. And what's the source of hope, by the way, in this? Is it? Is it John Kerry? Where's the real hope in this? Who is it up to? It's up to us. We're the ones that have to choose which way this goes. And so Kerry is more of our strategy. He's more of, a, of, a, of an instrument, but we're at the center of it. Of course, he did that in the campaign very well. Now, I'm going to show one more example very quickly. Um, and this is uh, not of Barack Obama, this is of, uh, of uh, one of uh, our students, uh, James Croft, uh, who's a student at the Ed School and was a teaching fellow uh, with us well this fall, but also a couple of years ago when he took the public narrative class. Uh, this is his five minute public narrative, uh, which he did as a, as a final for the public narrative class. Now, take a look at how he does self, us, and now here. There's a different sequence. Again, what are the choices? What are the values embedded in the choices? What are the details that bring it alive? And sometimes we're confronted with technical challenges. <laughs> Okay, while, while that's happening, um, all right, uh, questions, comments? Uh, yeah, you've been having a question over there. I just have a question about uh, when we try to get some emotions, get, make people angry or make them yeah. uh, have a reaction, sometimes there is some context or in some circumstances where people are even below that stage, where uh, even trying to get that kind of response is uh, people are becoming, are developing a sense of... <laughs> sense of pacifism and uh, yes. trying to protect themselves com in combination with uh, feeling so powerless. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. Yeah. So, uh, how would we confront that? How would I, we not that? by making a speech. Uh, a lot of relational work, a lot of close work. But the elements are going to be the same. There's still going to be some challenge there that's going to have to be brought alive and some sense of possibility that's going to be have to be brought alive. It's not by some guy making a speech. It often is in one-on-one -on -one encounters. It's by bringing people together with each other, recognizing that they share a problem, recognizing they might be a source of hope. No, I know what you're talking about. And I mean, at the base of every movement is that challenge. And it's, and it's, it's, it's the hardest challenge uh, because it's, it's breaking through that uh, fear and resignation. Uh, but, you know, you'd be surprised how quickly it can catch flame. Uh, when there's the right kind of sparks. Uh, and, but we'll be working on that all semester. I appreciate the question. Mm -hmm.
Let's uh, take a look at James here. anything like what Tyler went through when I was at school, but I was bullied for being gay. You see, when I was a kid, I was a ballet dancer, and every week I squeeze into a leotard and blue shiny hot pants. It was uh, quite an outfit, and I spent an evening practicing demi-pies and pirouettes, and I loved it. I loved the discipline, the music played on the old piano, the feel of the wood beneath my feet. I even secretly quite liked the outfit. <laughs> but my schoolmates and some of my teachers didn't like ballet as much as I did. And one of my teachers, a PE teacher, used to make fun of me. He used to say how girly I was, how dancing is not something that a boy should do. I remember the sneer on his face as I walked past, and I remember that he was the first person to call me a fag, which at seven years old, I didn't really understand. I remember in high school how gay was only ever used as a term of abuse. And I remember one cold morning sitting in assembly while the principal intoned, homosexuals deserve our pity and our prayers. And I sat among hundreds of other boys thinking I was all alone in the world and that I was the only one who had this problem. Now not everyone may have experienced something like that, but we all know I think what it means to feel alone, to feel like there's no one on our side. Perhaps you were too tall and the short kids made fun of you. Or perhaps you were too short and you got it from the taller ones. Or perhaps you were too smart or too dumb, or from the wrong side of town, or the wrong race. We all know, I think, even if just for a moment, what it feels like to think that there's no one on your side, to think that no one has your back. And all of us, if there are young people in our lives that we care about, can agree that we don't want this to happen to them. Imagine, if you can, what it must be like to come home and see a strange shape hanging from a tree in your backyard, twisting in the wind, the creak of the branch as it bends beneath the weight, and that feeling in your gut as you get closer and you realize what it is hanging there, who it is, who it was, because that was Seth Walsh. 13 who hung himself from a tree in his backyard. It was Billy Lucas who hung himself at his grandmother's house. And it was Raymond Chase who hung himself in his door. And it could have been your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, or your friend. It could have been one of us. So I know, I, I only came out in March this year. After 10 years, 10 years after I first told my parents that I thought I was gay. And in those 10 years, I lost a lot of opportunities to make a difference. I was a high school teacher, and every day I wasn't out was a day I deprived a gay student of a positive role model. And I'm not willing to waste any more time. I have to act now. We have to act now. Because it isn't enough to let these things happen and then mourn them afterwards. We need to catch these kids before they jump. And there is something we can do to help as a start. Journalist Dan Savage has started a campaign, the It Gets Better campaign, to send messages of hope to teenagers who are being bullied because they're gay or for whatever reason, that they should have hope for their future, that they do have something to live for. And I think that if we made such a video, as Harvard students with glittering careers ahead of us and sparkling degrees, then we could make a difference. So we need people to hold a camera, to share their stories, to do editing and sound, to stand in a big group and say it gets better. No contribution is too small. And if you want to get involved, and you're an undergraduate, talk to Tevin here, do you mind waving? Oh, hi. And he'll tell you how to get involved. And if you're a graduate student, or if you just want to come along, 
from 5 to 7 p.m. in the Elliot Lyman Room in Longfellow Hall at the Education Schools campus. Stand up and say, we're standing with these kids. We've got your back. Let's catch them before they jump. Thank you. Okay. Um, what did he start with? Was it a story of self or a story of us or a story of now? Sorry, what? Why? What made it a now? Urgent? Powerful, real, challenging. Then where does he go from that story of now? Where does he go next? Just wait till this uh, stops. Okay, so he starts with now, then where does he go next? Okay, and then where does he go from there? And then where does he go? Does he? And what does he, where does he, what, what happens in that second visit to self? What's that about? Huh? So in terms of these, uh, What's he, what's he doing here? A little urgency in terms of self. And then he winds up where? Where does he wind up at the end? Yeah, winds up in a now. See, so it's, it's structured differently. Obama goes self, us, now. This goes now, and then self, and then us, and then self, and then back. It's just that this isn't a script, but the elements are there. And, and so, how does this work here? When, when, how did, you know, I think what's particularly interesting in this one is the question of, um, did you feel part of an us? How so? I mean, this is, you know, you could take this issue and describe it in a very particularistic way, couldn't you? So what's he doing here? Yeah. He signals that we are all part of minorities somehow, and somehow we, Sometimes in our life, feel like we don't fit in somewhere. So he's going to a shared human experience. And what's he then trying to evoke in us? What, how would you describe what he's trying to evoke in us around that us? Some courage he wants to get to, but what else? What kind of feelings he trying to yeah. give us? Huh? A kind of empathy? To stand up for each other. That's where he wants to go, but he wants to also remind us of what? And it really feels awful. In other words, he's trying to see. Sometimes on the us, people sort of get confused between a categorical us, like everybody with this with brown hair line up over here, a categorical us, versus an experiential us. This is an experiential us. See, what he's trying to do is use shared experience to identify some shared values around which he can then motivate motivate engagement. This is one of the real distinctions between values-based organizing and you know, organizing around specific issues and sort of thing. It goes deep, because it goes deeper to sort of core values that, that we hold. And, and this is an interesting instance uh, of it here. Um, what about him? I mean, what about, what about the two stories of self? What, what, what did you make of that? What did you get from that? Huh? Yeah. So, so tell, tell me so, about So, for example, the first image of himself, he described himself as, as suffering, he, he, and that makes people angry when you hear that suffering. And then he was able to change that into another image of himself. He, cre he clearly created apathy at some point. And to another image of himself where that was transmitted into hope. Yeah. And that hope was also transmitted to the us, and so what he can do. No, it's really well. How many people experienced that, which you just described? See, there's a core dynamic here of challenge and hope, challenge and hope. And, and it's at the heart of this whole motivational enterprise when it comes to leadership and organizing. Without challenge, there's no motivation to do anything. Without hope, there's no motivation either. It's like, it's like the intersection of the two. 
you know, and when you think about it, I mean, who who in this room has had experiences of pain? And who has had experiences of hope? See, if you hadn't had experiences of pain, you wouldn't think that the world needed fixing. And if you hadn't had experiences of hope, you wouldn't think you had a ghost of a chance of fixing it. And see, those experiences turn out to be a, a, a resource, a repertoire, a resource of experience you can draw upon to communicate to others and share with others, because other people have those experiences too. And it's sort of then how you begin to build this, this, um, this story over here of the challenge and the sense of possibility to challenge this part over here. And you described it uh, really well, the way he makes the challenge real in the first part, and then he brings a lot of a sense of hope in the second part. Yeah? No, I think that's right. No, I think there's definitely anger there. And see, I think one of the problems, I think sometimes we, we're, uh, we're uh, too afraid of anger. I mean, you know, there's a lot to be angry about. <laughs> and, and, and the problem is to, to the question is how to, how, to, how to use it to energize doing something about it, right? And pretending it's not there or hiding it or that it's not there is probably one of the worst things we can do. And so the question is then how to incorporate it. How to how to treat it as a, as a resource for for change, and no, and I think you're right. I think uh, he that's this definitely was going on in there. And look, and you know this this whole story of now thing. I mean, part of it comes from Hillel, but it also comes from uh, Dr. King. Uh, the the name of the March on Washington speech, 1963, was uh, the the fierce urgency of now. And that talk, you know, everybody, how do you think of that talk, March on? What, what do you? What do you call it? How do you refer to it? I have a dream. Yeah, well, that's nice, uh, but that wasn't what the talk was about. No, it wasn't what the talk was about. The Kennedy administration was dragging its feet. Civil rights movement had to figure out how to put the heat on the Kennedy administration. They mobilized a thing to do that. And if you go back and listen to the whole speech, the whole first half is about the nightmare that preceded any kind of vision of a dream. And anger is very real in there. But then it is flipped into a source of motivation to act. And that's kind of where the action is. That's kind of where the action is. Does that make sense? That's kind of where the action is here. So, so you know, uh, we're used to sort of wanting to distance ourselves from emotion and, ooh, that's scary and all that kind of stuff. Um, welcome to the world of emotion because if you're actually going to engage people in the work of change, this is one of the critical dimensions in which you'll need to find your way. Uh, and the thing about it is we have the resources because See, we're hardwired to do this stuff. I mean, that's the other thing about it. See, a lot of these skills we're going to do in organizing, um, they sure weren't invented at the Kennedy School. I mean, you know, public narrative? I don't know, the first instance I've ever seen of it was in Exodus 8, um, where this guy Moses again, um, you know, is, is being a shepherd, and he sees this light off the side of the road, and he goes, steps off this road to investigate this light, and it turns out to be a bush that's burning, and not consume that he hears a voice and says, Moses, or Moses, we're not sure there's a theological debate about that. But, and, and, but he's confronted with this challenge to go back and, and sort of free his people. And his first response is, anybody know? Why me? It's the first response. And then, wait a second, who are you? And who are these people? And then, couldn't this wait? They have to do it right now? See, so th this dynamic that we're working with here has been around. And, and the thing about it is we're all natural storytellers. You're all natural storytellers. You tell stories all the time. And so all we're talking about doing here is taking something you implicitly know how to do, make it explicit so that you can do it with intentionality and purpose and craft. And that's, that's a lot of the practices we're going to be working on, like relationship building, like strategizing, or like that. But this is one we've all got this gift. And so the question is how we hone it and turn it into a powerful tool that we can use for leadership. So we've got just a few minutes left here. So um, what are some of the takeaways from today's class? What are some takeaways? Yes? I just like the James Cross piece because I think he, 
voices very authentic to from like victim to bystander to activist mm -hmm. played a lot of roles. No. What else? I yeah. have a question. I'm stuck at this um this chart. It's, this one? Yeah. As a leader, can't the arrows go both ways? Won't there be times when we might want to inhibit action? When you want to inhibit action? In certain ways. Well, Yes, I, I guess it depends on how you define action. But I mean, if, if you understand action to be mindful and intentional action, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's all about moving ourselves to places where we can do something about what we need to do something about. It might be that what we need to do is plan for a year, but usually not. Usually we're backing away from action when what we need it when we need to do it. I mean, because the whole thing about, you know, I, that's usually the problem. But I'm not talking about jumping off a bridge. I'm not talking about mindlessness. I am, to, though, talking about taking seriously the work of, of beginning to change things and act. Other takeaways? Yeah. Um, if you don't see for yourself, someone else will do it. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. I've shown that time. Um, <coughs> yeah, show not tell on stories is great. Yeah, show not tell on stories is crucial. In the examples we saw, the visuals, the details, the colors, allow other people to see what's going on. And see, this, the, the, the gift of storytelling is related to episodic memory, which is related to capacity for visualization. And the more visual the story is, the more other people can feel it. And so paying attention to the visuals, to the details like that, that's what makes you a good storyteller. And, and that's what brings this stuff alive. Yes? The use of anger. So far, I've been always told, you never really get angry, Michael. Compliment, but <laughs> 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 I figure I'm maybe just afraid of, of using anger and, and tapping into that source. Mm -hmm. Okay, which section are you in, Mark? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> no, look, no, look, I, I, no, I think it's a really important comment that Michael's making to pay attention to. It really, because see, if it's not acknowledged and, and engaged, it comes out, it acts upon you instead of you acting upon it. You lose agency, <coughs> but by recognizing it and claiming it, then you get to act on it. Then you become the agent, not the anger. And that's the deal. Same thing with fear. I mean, that's that's kind of. Uh, thank you for that. Other, yeah. Um, if you you don't have to tell your own story, you can tell your dad's or your grandfather's. Yeah, but only goes so far. <laughs> only goes so far. Yeah, we because we're going to be pressing you. So in class on Thursday, uh, you're going to be you're going to have two minutes. Two minutes, and this is quite intentional and purposeful to focus on, on images, to share with your classmates a story about why you've been called to, how you, what you feel yourself called to. And, and in their reference with relationship to who and, and what, but the real focus there more on thinking back to some of those experiences, moments, choices that had a real influence on you so that your classmates can begin to get an understanding of where you're coming from. Yeah. So will our classmates be the us, or who we're, we're intending to be? Uh, for now, your us can be sort of a, a, a general us. Uh, I mean, eventually the us is, yeah, the us is going to be who you're trying to organize. That may include your classmates. Uh, it's, it's quite possible that it might. It's, yeah, I mean, well, it could be. could be. I mean, it's kind of... How do you want to make yourself understood? What's called you to this class, to this work, to why are you doing this? What, what can you tell us about why you care about what you care about on this thing? You know? So we're not talking about why you care, say, about your spouse, but we're talking about why you care about this public work that you've taken upon yourself. Yeah? Are we supposed to send our TAs a draft of that story or just some thoughts in response to the questions on the worksheet? Just response. The, the worksheet is more to get you thinking about it. And just it's sort of to try to crank over the engine and kind of get you thinking about it. But then, uh, then you'll present uh, two minutes uh, in class, and it'll all be okay. All right, we're over time. See you on Thursday.